woman with the issue of blood. Um, the story is found in St. Mark, Mark chapter 5. And we had looked at her story in detail before we took a break last week. You know, told you what the woman was enduring, you know, having um, this constant bleeding, you know, constant menstruation for 12 long years, losing blood, unable to touch anyone. You know, if she sits on anything or touches anything, it will become unclean. You know, so, and this was happening for 12 long years. She spent all she had, every single dime, and the Bible says she got no better. But the Bible says she rather grew worse until she spent all she had. So she was stone broke. And we had said that the lady lived in Caesarea Philippi, and that was 57 miles away from Jesus was. Right? And remember now, if there was public transport, she couldn't take any public transport because, you know, the seat that she sit on would become, un, you know? And um, back then it is said that you could travel, you know, maybe if you're walking on foot or so, 15 miles in one day, or a donkey. So it took her four days to get to Jesus. And what we also said was, where she was um, in Caesarea Philippi, you know, it was a, a Gentile city, and their god was a, a god by the name of Pan. <laughs> but Pan couldn't help her with her situation. Pan couldn't help her. Physicians couldn't help her. But thank God she heard about Jesus. And the woman said to herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. She said she knew she would be made whole. Knew. So she never had to state her request to Jesus or tell Jesus what was happening to her. But the woman actually snatched a miracle out of Jesus. And the Bible says immediately as she touched the hem of his garment, the woman felt in her body that something had happened, that she was made whole. And Jesus himself also said that he felt some miraculous power, some virtue, leaving his body. My God. So now, that's a brief recap. So let's pick up. So, we said that the woman's issue was not a moral issue. It was a normal body issue. You know, ladies menstruate, but it's just that she had a disorder. And according to the ceremonial laws, she had to keep herself separated from <laughs> other persons. So can you imagine, you know, I just imagine if she had children for 12 long years, she wouldn't touch them or she would cause them to become unclean. If she had a husband, she couldn't touch husband, sleep in the same bed with husband because husband would become unclean. So it must have been very difficult for her. Remember now the theme? Now the thing is um, poor in wealth, but rich in faith. So the woman did something that was virtually illegal. So, so let me pick your brain now. So, so this woman <laughs> did something that is said that was very brazen. So she mingled with the crowd. So can you imagine them say, you know, you said, so you know, no, no harm, you know, you know, no kill you. You know how much people she made unclean, but them don't know, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, you know, you have to be unclean until the evening and go wash yourself. Yeah, you have to wash yourself and separate yourself and you'll be unclean until the evening. Right? So everything she touched. So a lot of people she made unclean. But what you know, nah, I'll kill you. <laughs> nah, I'll kill you. All right, so, so, I can I imagine now? Because according to the ceremonial law, if she was found out to be in the public, she could be stoned to death. 
So it's a big risk the woman took, you know. She took a very, very big risk. Right? Mingled with so many people. Because Jesus always had a crowd round about him. Right? And everyone she came in contact with would have become unclean. Right? And if they had known, they would not have been a happy set of people. They would be angry and upset. Can you imagine if it was a case like that in Jamaica? Because remember, we had a case in Jamaica where, you know, if you go in a public, you know, and sneeze or cough, you know, yeah, man, you could, you, you could have, yeah, in fact, persons were physically harmed, you know. Yeah, man, if you go in a public and when COVID just came around, and there are communities where persons had the COVID virus and them couldn't tell nobody. Right, contact tracing was very difficult because of the risk involved. Persons are burning out and don't want to because at that time we were pretty ignorant of what the COVID virus, you know. So persons said, no, so this thing will kill people. They come near us. So yeah, and we have heard it. A man was on a bus, I heard, and made the mistake of sneezing, right? And maybe not a thing was wrong with it. And, you know, and the people them start beat up the man. Yes. So in this situation, with this woman, with the issue of blood, rightfully, you should be stoned to death if you are found in public. So the woman took a big risk to travel all them 57 miles to find Jesus. My God. So when it comes to Jesus and what he can do, you have to take a chance sometimes, you know. So we know people don't want to take a chance and say, boy, I try this and I try that and I fear. But try Jesus, man. Take a chance with Jesus. You know, you'll never be disappointed. So, can you imagine what would have happened if one person in the crowd, you know, had brought it to the attention of the others before she touched Jesus? What would have happened? Maybe this woman would have been a dead, 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 dead woman. But my God, my God, my God. My God, but her need kind of override all the fears and apprehension she had. If I can but touch, if I can but touch the helm of his garment. So this woman was in a desperate situation. Right? And when you're desperate, you can't act like things are normal. <laughs> when you're desperate, <laughs> your desperation has to show in your approach to Jesus. So you remember the story of the, the, the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was grievously vexed with the devil and her gods, Baal and Astaroth, couldn't help her. And somehow she got wind that Jesus was at a particular place. And she went there and the woman was behaving carrying on, you know, not saying, oh, Jesus, will you please help me, my daughter? The woman said, Jesus! No, son of, have, you know, that's what the woman was shouting. And they hear the disciples, oh, Lord, send her away. She's crying after us. Us, the disciples, you know, who could not help the woman's daughter. <laughs> you know, send her away. She's crying after us. And I'm sure <laughs> when I read the thing, it never said, they said, oh, disciples, the woman said, Jesus, thou son of David. So she was calling after Jesus, but the disciples said, she's crying after us. You know, sometimes we can be so overawed with our self-importance. You know, even in the church, you know. So God might use us to do something anointed or so. We think it's us, but it's not us. It's a God in us. And we should always understand that persons are reaching for the God in us because we can't help them, sister. Sister Dolores, we can't help people. It's the God in us. Right? So, she had to respond. And her response was desperate faith. In her mind, she realized that it would have to be no or never for her situation. You know? So to go to Jesus now and something will happen or stay in my condition and eventually I'm going to die because the life of the flesh is in the blood and if you're losing blood constantly for 12 years, eventually you're going to die, you know. 
because back then, they never had any blood transfusion <laughs> and so forth. So this woman was constantly losing blood. I remember now, Brother Louis, she was at a point now where she never had no money. Staunch broke. So eventually, she would have faced death. Right? But she says, no, I never have got to get to Jesus. And I don't know if there's a woman with issue of blood situation here. Maybe not a bleeding situation, but maybe it's an illness in the body. Or a need you have. A desperate need. And you just got to get to Jesus today. Well, he's not far away, you know. Uh, he's only a prayer away. He might only be a praise away. He might only be a worship away. But somebody today, you've got to get to Jesus. So, this woman said, I'm not going to stay here and die. But I'm going to press my way to it. I've heard about Jesus. I've heard the things he has done. I've never heard of Jesus healing anyone with an issue of blood. But based on the things I've heard about Jesus and the things he has done, I know issue of blood is simple matter with God. And that's how faith operates, you know. So we the apostolics or the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't believe in blind faith, you know. No man, our faith is rooted in the fact that though I have not seen God do the thing I want him to do, but based on the things I've seen him do, I know that the thing I want him to do, simple matter with God. Faith, that's how faith operates, right? Faith, right? So you have complete trust, confidence, and reliance upon God because of the things that he has done. Praise God. So then, her desperate faith was rewarded. She received her healing. Um, it is interesting to know that Jesus never referred to her as unclean. Because obviously, she, you know, she was unclean based on her condition. But as I told you two weeks ago, Jesus said unto her with such compassion, he said, daughter, daughter, go in peace. Your faith hath made you whole, daughter. Such an endearing word. You know, such a comforting word because, of course, when she told her story now, you know, persons could have gotten out of hand now, you know, and said, listen, man, you know. But no, 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 no. Daughter. Said daughter. So this woman's need, right, to be made whole resulted in her disregarding the rules concerning her uncleanness as she made her way to the healer. So she had desperate faith. You know, and sometimes, you know, sometimes people go to the doctors and other places and the doctor does his diagnosis and sometimes it's not good, it's negative. And sometimes it's not the sickness, you know, that the doctor diagnoses, kill you, you know, a worry and fret kill you, you know. Yeah, worry and fret kill you. So my God, did, you know, yeah, many a times that happened. People worry about the thing. Right? Not the thing itself, you know, but worry about the thing that the doctor say you have and that kill you. But no, 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 no. But sometimes we have to disregard what the doctor says, you know. Whose report will you believe? God has the final word. Right? So I'm going to present it to God. I remember I told a story. A particular um, lady was in a coma in a hospital. It's a true story. And the doctor said, you know, she has been in a coma for some time. And the doctor said, listen, you know, she's not breathing her own. You know, the heart is not pumping on its own. You know, and, and the doctor said to the, the family members, you know, please give us permission to unplug her from the machine that's keeping her alive. Because she's, as far as we're concerned, dead, dead, dead. Now, the family members say, hold on, hold on, hold on. You know, let, let me go put it before God. Let's go tell it to the church first. So they call their pastor. And their pastor said, tell the doctors not to pull anything yet until we have heard from heaven. And then they began to, to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray. And they kept on asking the parents, you know, what have they heard from heaven yet? And they, they called the pastor, the pastor said, no, we haven't heard from heaven yet. Right? 
And eventually they called, the pastor called, right? And, and said to them, all right, take a phone, a cell phone into where she is, right? And put it right by her ears so she can hear, right? Because the pastor heard from heaven, you know, right? And, and the pastor said to her, I command you life to come back into the body, right? And immediately as the pastor said those words through the phone, right? Immediately the lady came back to life and got up and said, I want some Pepsi and some chicken to eat. <laughs> Says, no matter whose report are you going to believe, right? Don't do a thing until you have heard from God. Because he has the final word. And, and we're not just saying these things in our brother Richards. These things you have to put in practice. Because I know in church we say a lot of things, right? And we, and we say, oh yeah, that's good, that's good, yeah, that's for them. But the God that we're talking about hasn't changed. It's the same God, right? He changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the thing about our God is our God is all that we can think him to be. He's all that we need him to be. And he's everything now that he shall ever be. He's unchangeable. So if God did it for them, my God, God is waiting to do it for us too. Waiting. But we have to exercise faith. So faith is the key that unlocks the power of God. So I told you earlier that the woman, Jesus never said that it was his power. Though he felt the miraculous power virtually leaving his body, he never said it was his power, you know. He said, thy faith had made you whole. I have power all the time. But you have, if you use your faith and just plug in into the door and open it. My God, I can do things for you. I can defy doctors. I can defy circumstances. It doesn't matter how bleak it seems. Your back may be against the wall. You may be at the Red Sea. And the sea is before you, mountains on either side, and the enemy is behind you. But God said, I can open Red Sea, and you walk through and dry ground, make water back up. When you look at water, water coming like a wall. Knock, knock, knock. Solid wall. And the Bible said, you walk through and dry ground. God dry up every single one, so no mud on their feet. <laughs> dry ground. That's the God we serve. So poor in wealth, but rich in faith. And I hope you haven't forgotten that message that Pastor Fisher preached several Sundays ago. That said we should always live with an atmosphere of faith. One about our sister, sister Foresight, an atmosphere of faith. Right? Because God is willing and ready to work. So she disregarded the rules concerning her uncleanness as she made her way to the healer. Her great faith gave her assurance that if she could but just touch the hem of his garment, she would be made whole. Her faith told her that was all she needed. You know? And it was so. Right? In Mark chapter 5, verse 30, it records that Jesus said unto her, his confused disciples that someone had touched him. Because they were saying, Jesus, look at the crowd round about you. How comes you can ask a, a silly question like that? Who touched you? Persons from every angle pressing on you, you know? So you might be pressing on him, you know, but her touch was different. A different touch. You know, her, her touch was a touch that involved 12 long years of suffering. You know, 12 long years of spending all she had, you know? 12 long years of believing that she could be made whole. And then told, your condition is terminal. We can't help you. 12 long years. And I told you then that what Jesus in effect was asking was Jesus was saying, someone has made a demand upon my ability to perform a miracle. Someone has demanded me by my own word to do something that's impossible. The touch, touch. Someone is asking me 
to do that which the doctors have said is impossible but they can't help someone who touched me right but he knew that something had happened because he felt virtue miraculous power force leaving his body so as we had said in the first lesson every one of us have to have what we call some inner braces some structure some support something that will help us in the time of difficulty because the Christian journey is never a bed of roses you know <laughs> it's never a bed of roses if it has been a bed of roses for you up to this point you know as night follows day your difficult time will come just watch out it will come right it will come so you have to have something you know something that you can lean on something that you can call to remembrance and and and, and the bible is replete with these things you know so remember in in first samuel chapter 30 so david was fleeing from saul so david was anointed king of israel and for 14 years he could not go up to the throne, you know. Had to be running for his life, living in caves, behaving like a madman, spitting up on his beard, and all sort of thing in order to stay alive. So then, <laughs> then the Agag, the king of the Philistines, gave him a little plot of land called Ziklag. And remember now, he had around 600 men with him. And the Bible said those men were distressed. They were indebted and they were um, distressed, indebted, and something else. I, I, you know, First Samuel chapter 22 tells you. I, I've forgotten the, the, the final one. Indebted, they were distressed, and, and something else. Right? So they had very little, but they decided to cling with David because they knew the anointing was on David and he was anointed to be king. And the Bible says, while they were away, the Amalekites came and took their wives and their children and completely burned the city down. And the Bible says, when the men came and they saw it, first thing they began to cry. Everybody lifted up their voice and they wept and they cried, they wept and they cried. Until when they tried to cry, they couldn't cry no more. They lost the ability to cry. They lost the power to cry. That's how broken they were. <laughs> Can you imagine you have very little? And then the little you have is taken away. My God. That will cause for distress, you know. And, and, and we've got to, you know, though we're members of the body of Christ. But when things like that happen to you, some things happen to you, you know. And the first thing you know, think about is to call Jesus, you know. No, because a human... You, the human side of you tripping. You know, go call Jesus first, you know. You go weep and cry first. And then after the weeping and crying was done, the people them take the side now. So we're going to stone David. David, are your fault? David never asked them to come join him, you know. Right? They joined him because they saw that he was anointed and the anointing was on him. And they decided to stone David to death. But the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. David had some inner braces that he could stand upon. So David reminded himself of the victories that God helped him to win. Lion and bear and him tear them to pieces. David probably reminded himself of old Goliath. Right? Slay old Goliath. And David said, listen, my man, if God can help me with this, then no man. So he began to encourage himself in the Lord. And then David called... Um, Abiathar, you know, the son of Ahimelech, the high priest, you know, and said, carry the prayer shawl, come over, we'll talk to God. And David went to God and asked God, shall I pursue? You know, shall I overtake? And God answered back and told David something he never asked. God said, pursue, you shall surely overtake and you're going to recover all. You have to have some inner braces. And I'm saying, if your difficult time hasn't come yet, 
you know, just rest assured it's coming. Listen to the testimonies around, you know, and listen to the experiences of others because you're going to need something to lean on when your difficult time comes. So that's why, you know, that's why I tell you, you know, I like to hear good testimonies, you know. I don't really like testimonies of people testify a, a quote, you know, Lord is my light and my salvation. I want to hear what God do for you. So that when the same thing happened to me, we can know that God can do the same thing for me. More you tell me something where God do for you. We can instill, inspire faith in my heart. Mark you, you have a, you, you quote your scripture verses, you know, what sometimes I say that you quote David's testimony. I want to hear what God has done for you. That, that's just me. That's me, all right? Yeah. So, there has to be some inner braces that you have to stand on. So, the response of the one with issue of blood was that she demonstrated the presence of some very strong inner braces. You know, her life manifested steadfast focus, determination, persistence. You know, I can just imagine how maybe she was feeling tentative as she started the journey. But was asking herself many questions, you know. I wonder if I go where Jesus lives, he'll be there. Because you know, Jesus was an itinerant preacher, was all over preaching. You know, she, she probably wondered. You know, she was thinking about several things, you know. You know, and then she probably wondered, no, Brother Lewis, and say, my, if I'm found out that I'm making, you know, so many people unclean, then I could very well be stoned to death. So several things were in her mind. But the woman was persistent. She was determined. She was steadfast. The woman wasn't having any pity party. I'm saying, you know, I was speaking to a friend. I was speaking to a gentleman recently. You know, he and I happened to have been in some class together, you know, some religious classes, you know. And some of the things he said he heard in the class, he said he was going to put it in practice. So he said he went to a particular church to preach. And there was a particular lady there that had some stage four cancer. And the doctors had sent her home from the hospital and said, listen, we can't help you anymore. And her relatives had already planned her funeral. This is the funeral program. So he was there preaching and he said, no man, some of the things I'm here, I put in practice, right? And he prayed for the woman. Right, and I don't know the prayer he prayed. He prayed for the woman, you know. And then he went back, they said three weeks, you know, to plan the woman's funeral service. I said, three weeks' time, you're a Ghana. Plan the funeral service. So he prayed. I said, listen to me, I'm coming back sometime, and this woman is still going to be living. And he went back over a year, you know. And now, now they can't execute the funeral program because the woman's still alive. I wonder if you understand the God we serve. So, we are filled with the Holy Ghost. Baptized in Jesus' name. Right? And we say, when we say filled with the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, I probably should ask um, Brother Carnegie to tell us, Holy Ghost, fill us up. Right? And he says, you take an empty bottle, empty bottle and you take off the cork and you put it in a jar of water. Not only does water fill the inside of the bottle, but water is all around. So Holy Ghost all around us and Holy Ghost fill us up. You understand the privilege we have? You understand that we have better promises than those in the Old Testament? I wonder if we understand who we are. My, 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 my. I wonder if we understand who we are. Mm -mm. My, my, that's for some other time. Who am I? And whose I am? Mm. My, my, my. So she must have felt a bit tentative. Right, and you know, weighing the risk, etc. Right? And then, you know, 
I can imagine that maybe something was telling her, listen, my man, you're not going to happen. You're not going to find Jesus. What if they find you out? Right, so she was a bit, you know, tentative. And remember, we don't know, we can't tell how she traveled there, you know. Maybe she had her donkey, her own donkey, but the mere fact that they said that she had spent all she had in order to deliver her healing. Maybe she sold the one donkey she had. Right? So, I don't know if she walked. And I can imagine someone losing blood for 12 long years. It's going to be hard for you to walk upright, you know. You know? So maybe she was crouched over. You know, had to rest very often. But she said, I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see. One step at a time. You know, there are some people who on the verge of a miracle, you know. And they give up at the last moment. You know, I, I heard a story, if I can recall it well. So there was a man who was climbing some Mount Everest, etc. And then they slipped. And then his rope was holding him. Right? And, and I think someone had said, um, he heard a voice. Or someone was saying, cut the rope. But the man didn't know because it was dark. So he couldn't know where he was. You know, you have, you've heard that story. So I'm paraphrasing. And the man never cut the rope. Right? And when the man was found, the man was six inches off the ground. If he had followed the voice and cut the rope, the man would have been alive. Faith. Faith. So, but she kept on encouraging herself and said, my miracle is going to happen step by step. Step by step, I've got to see Jesus. If I can but touch, 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 you know, if I can but touch, right? And it happened just as she had imagined. In that moment, something happened, you know. But there are situations that we're in, you know, that has taken control of our lives. Illnesses, you know, difficult times. We have got to take control, man. No pity party. You know, we have to believe God until it happens. And remember now, delay doesn't mean denial. So you, you heard the story in Luke chapter 18 about the, the, the widow and the unjust judge. And she kept on knocking and knocking because the judge never had no regards for man, not even God. This judge never had any regards for And the woman kept on knocking and said, avenge me, you know, of my enemies. Right? And the judge said, listen to me, if I get up and deal with this woman, you know, then I will get no rest. And God said, I see him if you approach the Lord. Keep on persisting. You know, sometimes, you know, you know, I heard somebody say once, sometimes a church got a test with you know, Sister Dolores to see if the thing we ask God for, we really need it. So we pray to God for one whole year and because, you know, we say, all right. So God, I said, oh, you don't need it. But you have to be persistent, persistent. I saw something recently and somebody's, somebody sent me where a woman was praying for her husband for nearly 40 odd years. And after 40 odd years, they showed a picture of the man being baptized in Jesus' name. 40 odd years. The woman is praying for the husband. And the man wouldn't heal. And I know of a particular case, I so there's a particular case. So um former pastor of Penta, Pastor Sam Stewart. You know, his his mother and, and him and others have been praying for his father for years upon years upon years. Right, been going to church. He, his mother has been going to church. He has spent all his years in church. Over 50, nearly probably 60 years, 50 years of praying for him. And the man, Uncle Robbie, wouldn't budge. Right? Until it was a public holiday. Some persons, and I was there too, went home by his house and prayed him through to the Holy Ghost. You know, I remember he took up his phone and called Reverend Milton Kelly and said, Brother Kelly, me get the Holy Ghost. Over 50 years, you know, they have been praying for him. 
and he wouldn't go to altar and he got the Holy Ghost. And you know, he died the year after. The year after he died. So the man get the Holy Ghost just in time. Just in time. Just in time. Just in time. So, we have to take control, man. We have been praying about this thing for a long time. Don't give up, man. Take control. Encourage yourself. Take control. All right, let me run along. So, if the woman had not persisted, then there would have been no change in her situation. So she drew on her inner brace and inner courage. Right? Brave the crowd. Push through the crowd. You know, weak on woman. You know, thronged by many persons. Some want to see miracles. Some want to get, you know. But the woman pressed her away and was healed. Healed. And um, for many of us, it could be that, you know, sometimes victory is just in our hands. You know, but sometimes the devil hits us with fear. Fear and apprehension when victory is just right in our hands. And sometimes God tells us to do some things, you know. And because it's against medical science, we say, no, we're not doing it. Yeah, but sometimes you have to take a chance. So I'm going to testify a little bit. So I remember once, you know, I went to the doctor, eye doctor. And the doctor checked. And the doctor said, oh my God, at such a tender age, you have glaucoma. And the doctor prescribed some medicine that I should take, you know. But when I take the medicine, my eye kind of feel glossy and watery and, and I could manage the thing. So I have a conversation with God once. I said, God, but the thing that you have called me to do, Necessity that me need my eyesight. So do she tell me, say, you know, based on the condition of the eye, because at one stage, when I went to the doctor, for those who understand, you know, the, the pressure in the eye, they call it intraocular pressure. Normally, it's supposed to be like below 11. And when I went to the doctor, one of mine was like 20, 20 minutes in the 20s. And she said, listen, man, no man at this stage you can just have blindness. Your blindness can strike. And she said, as you leave here, go straight to the pharmacy and buy the thing. Right? So, I started taking the, the thing and I said, no, sir. We can't manage this. I went to a prayer meeting once. And I told him, I said, no, I went to the doctor. The doctor said, I have glaucoma. And I should take this thing for the rest of my life. But I said, based on what the Lord has called me to do, I need my eyesight. So I know so I can't go blind now. I'm going to tell him, say, listen to me, I've stopped taking the thing, and, and I want you to pray now, you know, because I know, I, I say, I know God is going to heal me, but I want to pray now, so that when I go back to the doctor and him do him test, I can have a testimony to testify to the doctor. So, after around four months, I went back to the doctor. <laughs> so the doctor said, tomorrow, Mr. Williams, did you take the job yesterday? He said, no. Day before, no, last week, no. When was the last time? I said, Doctor, I can't remember. Doctor sent me around several machines and checked and checked and checked. You know, and then the doctor said, My God, what the pressure's in your eye. So I told, I told the doctor about God, you know, some beliefs that God has healed me. I'm not afraid to tell the doctor that, you know. You have your stuff, me know my God, so me talk my stuff. So the doctor checked and checked and checked and found that the pressure was one was 10 and one was 11. Right? And then the doctor said, thank God, they're okay. I mean, said, Doc, I see him me. I tell you, thank God, they're okay. Thank God. Yes, yeah, thank God, they're okay. Right? And I've not, I've not taken any jobs like that. Every time I've been to the doc, you know, them check the ocular pressure, quite fine, 10-11. So let me tell you something. So I know what God can do. Yes. And if you know what God has called you to, then you don't have to worry. No, you don't have to be afraid. What God has called me to do, I'm not supposed to need my sight to do the thing that God has called me to. So I could stand on that. It was like an inner breeze. I could stand on that. I know, I so said, listen, man, I'm not going blind. Even the intraocular pressure reached 30. I'm not going blind. All right. For Mr. Brother Foresight, you know, it's the time is at hand, you know. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, so 
We've got to take control. We can't let the devil at the last minute come and us, um, instill faith and stop us from achieving our blessings. We've got to persist and take control and, and soldier on so we can have a testimony to show what God has done. Right? So, the lessons to learn from this is that like this woman, we've got to strive for obedience to the word of God. This is a brace we have, obedience to the word of God, right? And the Bible says that, you know, God is more pleased with our obedience than our sacrifices, right? Obedience is very important, right? And um, in the last, well, we're basically at the end now, so I want to engage in a little discussion, you know, to see if I'm just up here talking and what have you learned. So, so let me ask, you know, so what are some of the lessons that we can learn about moving in faith? What are some of the lessons we can learn about acting on our faith and having faith in God? Here, Brother Lewis, it's your time to talk. You know, what are some of the lessons you can learn? Yes, sir. From, from faith. Even if you read um, St. Matthew chapter 7, and I read them through verse 5, where the hypocrite was saying to the man that he should, um, or he should do his highs. But um, God says to him that he speaks like a, a hypocrite. Yes, yes. Cast him out, out of your high before you can see to take the beam out of your brother's eyes. That is St. Matthew chapter uh, seven verse five. Okay. Anybody else? What are some of the, the, you know, the lessons we can learn? Right. Yeah, talk to brother. Faith must be active. Faith must be in action. Faith is desiring, not yet seen. So you have to be continuous faith. You can't just, you know, up on and up, up off. So you got to be continuous. You have to be persistent. You got to be courageous. You got to be determined. You have to have a burning desire. And so when you, when you have that, that desire, then the Lord will grant you the desires. So if you desire healing, then the Lord will grant your faith. So faith must be active. You know, the Bible says without, without works, then we, are, we won't have any results. So we've got to be active. If, you, if somebody told you that, hey, I send the money for you, and you still want to say, money is there, I need the bill to pay the money. But if you don't get up, bail, put on your clothes, take the taxi, or walk, then you won't get the money. So that's, that's faith, active faith, action faith. So you have to act on faith. You know, faith is not um, just a, a thought in the mind. To put your faith into action. So I'd given a definition several weeks ago. I said faith is um, a conviction and a persuasion plus corresponding action. So you have to put some action to your faith. Not just I believe God, I believe God. And you sit there doing nothing. The woman could have said, I believe Jesus because Pan can't help me. But the woman put some action to her faith and said, listen to me, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. Anybody else? All right, my visitor here has been pretty um, attentive. Yeah. You want to say something? I saw Mr. Steve, I'm in love with you. You want to say something? <laughs> Woo! My, 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 my. Oh, come on, Brother Richards. All right, well, Brother Richards first. Sorry. Uh, yes, sir. So, um, one of the things that I have learned um, in order to activate your faith in Jesus Christ, you can break some rules in order to activate the faith, the belief in God as pertaining to the woman with the issue of blood it was unlawful for her to be out in the public so she broke the rules and be out there just to touch the garment so that she could get some healing based on her belief so in my in my um, understanding and what I have learned is that you can break some rules sometimes in order to activate 
your belief in Christ. Okay, so um, ru rules, rules like, for example, um, as as a as a lady was told, if you have issues of blood, you cannot be out in the public. But she broke that rule and be out in the public. Okay, so um, for example, the 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 doctor, my doctor, gives me some medication for hypertension and uh, when I went back to do the refill the, the pharmacist says to me you have not been taking the medication and uh, I said well not according to the doctor's orders and then she says to me but hypertension is something that you have to be careful of, it's a silent killer. And I said to her, well, I'm also a Christian and I, and I have prayed about this. So, you know, I kind of break, break the rule in terms of the medication. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, because, you know, in my case, the doctor told me to take eye drops and I said no. So you can't break that rule, but you know, we have to you know, put it in context what rules. You know, doctors, right, yes. Yes. Doctor said the pressure is yeah, the, the, uh, good, 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 good. So you have to just keep on believing God. Because we have known of several persons who have hypertension and diabetes. And they have been cured, you know, even by dieting. All right, Sister Lewis, I know you're burning to say something. <laughs> okay, when I go to the doctor, and the eye doctor, and he said, I have a cataract in my eye, and I have to go at it, no to get it out because one is better than the other one. And even my glasses, doctor, the same glasses, doctor take it off and actually just throw it down, so I have no use. And I said, I said, and I, I was saying to doctor, I said, doctor, cataract is in my eye and I'm have to go at it now. I said, doctor, where you go? Him to, I said, where you go now to get this cataract? He said, we can go to Hargreaves. I said, doctor, you still look, you, you look at me and look like I have money to go to Hargreaves, doctor? Okay, and the doctor said, well, you have to go and consider. I said, Doctor, I'm going to trust in Jesus. I said, Doctor, you believe that Jesus is a healer? He said, Yes, I believe that Jesus can heal. Well, he said, Doctor, I'm going to Jesus first to get some answer. That is faith to get some answer. And, and, and brethren, when I go back, um, a couple we, we went to him. Um, fasting service in, in St. Elizabeth. Our pastor was there. And he said, who need prayer to come? And when I go up and I tell pastor what about my condition, pastor come and he, pastor say, come and I, he lay hands on my eyes. And I believe that immediately my eye is healed. And after that, I go back to a doctor. And when I go back and they do the examination after, the doctor said, but you know that I get a reference from the same doctor that said I must operated on. And I care to the, the doctor, the other doctor. And he said, you know that you should be operating on, but you don't have no cataract in your eye. I said, doctor, thanks be to God. Hallelujah. I have been healed. I never afraid. Bridging, I start to speak some tongues there, you know. I, feel, I come in like, say, I'm mad. I just march up and down. When I hear that, no cataract is in my eye. Bridging, but even when I go to get the appointment to come back for October coming. October coming to check over the eye. I cut, I speak in some language. Some I have to be I control myself because I don't want the people to say I am mad. Virgin, my I have been healed and I believe that my eye is healed in Jesus' name. So that is faith in God and believe. And faith without work is dead. So you have to work with faith. God bless you. God bless you. That's a good note to end on. We have to believe God. We have to trust God. You know, have to trust God. Have to trust God. Praise God. All right. All right, Sister um, Reynolds is come, coming for prayer. So God bless you. So God's willing, the next time Sunday school, someone will talk to you. Well, someone will be teaching on, I think it's that woman. I think her name is Hannah. Yeah, so we'll deal with Hannah and I think Elizabeth. Well, God bless you. Let's stand.
Let's lift our hands and thank God. We have a God that we can trust. We have a God that we can put our faith in. A God who is touched by the feelings of our weaknesses. God whose name is a strong tower can run into it. And we will be safe. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the fact that you are our God. Lord, we don't know how we would have made it in this world if you were not on our side. But, oh God, you have promised never to leave us nor to forsake us. And in the midst of our difficulties, oh God, in the midst of our trials and testings, in the midst of bad report, you are with us. And we're so glad that you're the omnipotent God. You're the God who has all power. You're able to do all things. Oh God, for those who are weak in faith, oh God, who are being killed by doubt and unbelief. Oh God, I pray that faith will arise in our hearts even now. And that we'll trust you in all that we do, oh God. In the good times, we'll trust you. In the bad times, we'll trust you. For, oh God, you know the thoughts you think for us. Thoughts of good, peace, and not of evil. And, oh God, you're able to bring us to that expected end. Oh God, help us to trust you. Everyone who's here, oh God, you know the deepest desires of our hearts. But, oh God, we know that you're well able. Oh God, so we ask you now to act upon the good desires of our hearts. And help us to walk humbly before you. And trust you in all that we do. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for answering. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise God. God bless you.